Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss protection for the creative industries in the UK and to put in a good word for the creative industries in the United States and the rest of the world as well. You don't need me to tell you what British creativity has contributed to the world's cultural heritage. You've given the world its greatest playwright and his plays continue to pack houses around the world as well as here. British actors have won the Best Actor or Best Actress Award at the Academy Awards over 30 times and London theater is second to none in the world. British literature from Jane Austen, Charles Dickens and the Brontes all the way to Salman Rushdie and J.K. Rowling have captivated readers throughout the world. As a teenager in the 1960s, I, along with everyone else, was swept up by Beatlemania. And British musicians, as Jeff Taylor has mentioned, have been at the forefront of popular music ever since. And I personally am eagerly awaiting the appearance on American television of series five of Doc Martin and the final series of Spooks, two of my favorite TV series. And no, I wasn't the least bit tempted to download Spooks. I'm patiently waiting, impatiently waiting, I should say. In the UK, as in the United States, the creative indices also play a major role in the economy. We've heard the statistics for the UK. You've seen some of the statistics for the United States earlier. Uh, in a report issued last month, our Department of Commerce reported that in the United States, 5.1 million people are employed in our copyright intensive industries. Those industries represent about 3.5% of our gross domestic product and something in the neighborhood of 10% of our exports. So it's a very, very strong part of our industry as well. So whether we're speaking of cultural value or economic value, the creative industries are major contributors to society here in the UK and elsewhere. As general counsel of the US Copyright Office, that makes me feel like I'm working for a good cause. Copyright has become a much maligned concept lately, at least in some areas. But without copyright, the creative economy would be impossible. That's something that too many people don't seem to understand today. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people suggest that, for example, musicians should make their music available for free. They shouldn't expect to make money off of sales or licenses, but instead they should use their recordings to promote attendance at concerts. And they should make their money from sales of concert tickets, t-shirts, and memorabilia, or by donations from grateful fans. Even if that did work for them, I'm not sure how a songwriter or an author can support themselves off of t-shirt sales. And is it realistic or right to expect that musicians must be constantly on tour to make a living or must make their money by selling souvenirs when their recordings are so popular and so many people who had nothing to do with the making or legitimate distribution of the recordings are finding a way to profit from them? The fact is that while a very small minority of authors and artists may have the means to create works of authorship out of the goodness of their hearts without any hope of financial reward, most authors, like most of the rest of us, have to earn their keep. If an author can't hope to make money off of her book or a musician can't hope to make money off of his music, most are going to have to go into another line of work sooner or later. And that's where copyright comes in. Only by giving the author the exclusive right to exploit his or her work do we ensure that authors will have sufficient incentive to create the works that society wants them to create. That's why the United States Constitution gives our Congress the power, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. At the United States Copyright Office, we play a number of roles in furtherance of these goals. We serve as Congress's advisor on copyright law and policy. We also provide support and advice to other departments and agencies of the government that have an interest in intellectual property. We serve on delegations to international intellectual property organizations, such as WIPO. And we're involved in other multilateral and bilateral copyright-related negotiations. We get involved in major litigation, such as the recent Supreme Court case that upheld the constitutionality of our statute that provides retroactive protection for foreign works in order to comply with our obligations under Article 18 of the Berne Convention. We operate the largest copyright registration system in the world, and we run the legal deposit system for the Library of Congress, which is the library with the largest collection in the world, a collection that was largely built through the copyright law. Although we don't have any direct enforcement responsibilities, we are part of the Intellectual Property Enforcement Advisory Committee chaired by the new Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator, 
Victoria Espinel, who was appointed by President Obama, pursuant to an act of Congress, and who serves within the executive office of the President. Let me share with you a few of the things that we are doing in the United States to ensure that copyrights have meaningful protection. For the past couple of years, the United States Intellectual Property Rights Center has been conducting Operation In Our Sites, that's S-I-T-E-S, which focuses on websites that offer downloads and streaming of pirated copies of works of authorship and offer sales of counterfeit goods. So far, 758 domain names of websites engaged in the sale and distribution of illegal copyrighted works and counterfeit goods have been seized as a result of Operation In Our Sites. Most of these websites are located outside the United States, although they focus on serving, at least in part, a United States audience. But we are able to shut them down if they have a top-level domain administered in the United States, such as the ever-popular .com and .org. And while some of these online pirates have just popped up again at new addresses, many have apparently ceased operations altogether following the seizures. And what was rather surprising is that many other such sites, which weren't seized, nevertheless voluntarily stopped doing business. A similar phenomenon happened after the recent seizure of MegaUpload.com mega and the indictment of Kim.com and others involved with MegaUpload. A number of other so-called cyber locker sites have cut back on some of their more egregious practices, such as offering third-party file sharing or offering rewards to users based on the number of times works that those users have posted have been downloaded. While the mega upload prosecution was initiated by the United States, it was done with a cooperation in New Zealand, Hong Kong, the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, and Canada. I hope that such international cooperation will become more frequent as the battle against rogue websites continues. But the battle against online piracy is being fought on multiple fronts, and not just by prosecutors. The United States Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator has facilitated cooperative agreements among copyright owners and other important internet actors. In a moment, you'll hear Jerry Lewis talk about one of those agreements with online service providers. Another such agreement was allowed, announced last June with a number of major payment processors, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and Discover. This agreement put in place voluntary best practices whereby, upon being notified by a right holder, that a particular website is offering infringing copies or counterfeit goods and is using the payment processor's services to receive payment, the payment processor will investigate the merchant and, if the investigation confirms the allegations, will terminate or suspend payment processing services to the merchant unless the merchant has stopped selling infringing products. This follow-the-money approach has great promise in shutting down rogue websites that offer infringing copies for sale, as many do. The Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator has also obtained agreement from online advertisers to withdraw their advertising from fake pharmacy sites. And she's doing her best to encourage adoption of best practices agreements by internet advertisers, ad agencies, internet ad brokers, and ad exchanges that would prevent revenue from legitimate companies and create the appearance, uh, appearance of, le of legality by carrying such advertisements. Such, such best practices hopefully will stop that practice of having legitimate advertisements appearing on such sites. I think we can all agree that when these services that can be used to facilitate infringement cooperate in deterring piracy, it's a major step forward in the battle to preserve our creative industries. It helps that most internet service providers, payment processor, processors and others, do not want to be complicit in acts of infringement, but experience tells us that it helps even more when service providers realize that by offering their subscribers legitimate access to works of authorship and sharing in the proceeds from such sales or licensing, they can both do the right thing and they can both profit by doing it. And it also helps, I have to say, when the White House IP coordinator calls you into a room and urges you to come to an agreement. Let me add a couple more words about the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator because I know over here in the past year there's been talk about uh, such, a, uh, such a position. When Congress passed the law creating that position, it was informally dubbed the position of IP czar, or czarina as the case may be, and as the case is. But that's not really an accurate description. In fact, coordinator, which is the name in the title, really does capture the nature of the job. 
Her statutory duties are to chair an interagency intellectual property enforcement advisory committee, to coordinate intellectual property enforcement policy, and to recommend improvements in the intellectual property laws. She expressly may not control or direct any law enforcement agency in the exercise of its investigative or prosecutorial authority. But as I've already indicated, being the White House's point person on IP enforcement, just having a White House point person on IP enforcement, gives her the ability to bring people together, both within the government and from the private sector, in ways that promote cooperation. I couldn't begin to count the number of federal departments and agencies that have some interest in intellectual property enforcement. Having one person there to help ensure that we don't step on each other's toes and to coordinate enforcement activities makes for more efficient and effective enforcement. Well, I hope in the last 10 minutes I've been able to give you a good overview of how we value the creative industries and some of the things we're doing to protect them. Um, and in a moment, we'll hear from Jerry Lewis, who will tell you in somewhat more detail about one specific effort that's getting underway in the United States. Thank you. Can I just ask you, the, the, the focus for action by your organization, uh, is it the websites, is it the internet service providers, or who, who, where do you focus your...? The, the focus is multi, uh, on, on a number of fronts. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator has, has been engaged in talks with people from all sectors. ISPs, payment processors. Uh, so we're trying to hit all points at which infringement is facilitated. So, so, so an internet service provider, Comcast might be one, for example, uh, could find itself as the focus of legal attempts, legal action to prevent them from carrying particular information. Well, it could be, but they're really, I don't think that's been the focus of prosecution by any means. Uh, at the moment, the focus is on trying to get people to see that it's in their own interest to help protect intellectual property, uh, and that's been, what, uh, that's been what the attention has been paid to, as you'll hear in a moment. And, and what is your view of uh, copyright exemptions, as you will have, you, I mean, this is a bit arcane, perhaps, <laughs> but as you'll have heard, that, that there are kind of, there are, there are existing long-standing copyright exemptions fair for, for the purpose of comment and fair comment, fair right, dealing, right. and so on. Um, there's an argument that, uh, that's been running in the UK following a review by or is it an eminent Professor Hargreaves about, which you may be familiar with, Certainly. which suggests that actually traditional copyright, uh, the traditional approach to copyright is, um, notwithstanding bigger issues about piracy, is itself constraining the development of you know, important sectors, potentially important, economically important set of, you know, creative industries. What's your view about copyright exemption? Does the internet age require us, at the same time as underlining, or if you like, underpinning formal copyright positions, does it require us to change the way we approach copyright exemption? I don't know that it requires us to change the way that we approach copyright exemptions, but I will say that every copyright system I know has exemptions, and they're a crucial part of the copyright system. Uh, the, the, the most fundamental aspect of copyright, a, a well-working copyright ex right system, is exclusive rights for the author or the copyright owner. But everyone recognizes that in certain circumstances, there should be uses that, which otherwise might be infringing, that ought to be permitted. In the United States, we have fair use. I'm not going to go around the world prescribing fair use for everyone else. It works rather well in our tradition. Here you have fair dealing, and there are all sorts of statutory exemptions in your system and ours. They've been thought through, and for the most part, they work well. And it's inevitable, I suppose, that with technological development, there may be need for some tinkering to adjust to other needs. But broad-based exemptions, uh, I think that's a matter for national discussion. And perhaps in one country, it, the solution might be different than in another. And what do you say to our uh, friend from Spain, who has uh, infringing websites based in your territory that carry on doing it regardless? Well, I hadn't heard that before, but I intend to look into it. <laughs> Well, there you go. Even more good news, you see. Thank you very much. Thank Luke. you. That's really appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs>